You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie in the US. And I'm Johanna from Austria, and you're listening to your favorite international podcast. That's right. If you've never listened to us before, we are two friends who met online, oh, years ago, and realized we had the same interest in all things macabre, especially historical events throughout history. And so we started this little podcast. We've never met in person. We just get together once a week to talk to all of you. And and so here exactly. we are again. Yeah, that's our jam. I'd say our topics for the podcast are as random as we are. Yeah, they really Just are. Just all the things we find interesting yes. that we want to tell you. Yeah, so the nice, the, uh, the flip side of that, Johanna, is there's something for everyone. So That's true. <laughs> uh, I don't know, should we start? Yeah. Should we just let's, start? Let's get into it. So, you know we do love our so-called palate cleanser episodes after covering a lot of murder cases. Mm -hmm. From time to time, we just need to take a break and focus on more lighthearted things for our own sanity. Our latest episodes were all centered around the brutal death of teenagers, and I'm researching something right now that's actually, it's really gruesome, and it it's bad. So you all have that to look forward to. Uh, so we thought, you know, we could we could just use a little bit of a palate cleanser. By the way, I know we mentioned it before, but for all of our new Hellions, palate cleanser is just a term that I think you all started, our listeners. I think so, yeah. Right? For the non-murdery episodes. I think that was originally their term. And we think it's the perfect name, especially for this week. It couldn't be more perfect. A couple of days ago, my husband and I were watching this movie, The Menu, starring Ray Fiennes. I hope I uh, pronounced that correctly now. I never say his name, I realized. I just, I think it was one of the first times I said his name right now. I think it was not long ago that I told Paul it wasn't Ralph, it was Rafe. I don't think he believed me at first. <laughs> <laughs> In that movie, he plays a chef, uh, the chef of a high-end restaurant. I think you can hear my voice is still not completely back, but I'm feeling so much better. It's going to be fine. Good. The movie was great. I can highly recommend it. I truly enjoyed it. My husband loved it. Yeah, we liked it too. We just watched it this past weekend as well. Great cast. Great cast. I don't want to... So good. No spoilers. Yeah. It's weird. It's kind of a weird movie, but good. Very good. Anyhow, it's what made me think, wait a minute. We never did a whole episode about kind of macabre food history. I know we mentioned bits and pieces here and there, you know, like people ingesting ground up mummies in Victorian times, all the other cannibal cases we covered. Make no mistake, eating mummy powder, I'd still consider that a form of cannibalism, right? Yeah, for sure. Just because it doesn't look like people doesn't mean you're not actually eating people. Same goes for you, cauliflower. I'm looking at you. Like, it's everywhere. I don't care if you tell me it tastes <laughs> just like pizza crust. It's lies, and it does not. It's still cauliflower. Don't worry, we definitely won't be talking about cannibalism today. A lot of people will go like, oh, no, I know it. <laughs> Don't wait, there's always more cannibalism. <laughs> <laughs> this is more about interesting, funny, macabre stories about food. Yeah. Some of those stories you might already know, some of those might be new for you. But as always, it's going to be great for future pub quizzes. This is an episode about food, but it's not a very gross episode, I'd say. It's not like those weird reality TV shows. Do you have them over mm -hmm. there in the United States? I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. Fear factor. Something like that. Yeah, something like that, exactly. <laughs> so we won't talk about people stuffing their face with a plate full of living earthworms or, you know, this. Yeah. But we will definitely talk a little bit about animals being eaten. Livestock, poultry mostly. So just be aware of that. Yeah. We can't really talk about the macabre history of food without talking at least a little bit about the beginning of everything. And don't worry, it's really fascinating. Because the reason, or one of the reasons, why Homo sapiens developed the way that we did was fire. The ability to control fire, the skill to make fire, is what helped us not only spread out all over the world, because... Let's face it, we wouldn't have wandered out of Africa and settled in places like Northern Europe and North America if it wouldn't have been for fire. 
It kept us alive. It kept us warm. It helped us stay safe from everything lurking in the darkness waiting to eat us. But perhaps one of the most fascinating aspects, and something I think I've touched on briefly in the past, is the fact that having fire and being able to cook food with fire helped us develop the brain and physics that we have as modern day humans. So, let's get into some more specific information. This is just a very small excerpt from a fascinating article from smithsonianmag.org called Why Fire Makes Us Human by Jerry Adler. This was published in June 2013, and it says, quote, Wherever humans have gone in the world, they have carried with them two things, language and fire. Darwin himself considered these the two most significant achievements of humanity. It is, of course, impossible to imagine a human society that does not have language, but, given the right climate and an adequacy of raw wild food, could there be a primitive tribe that survives without cooking? In fact, no such people have ever been found, nor will they be, according to a provocative theory by Harvard biologist Richard Wrangham, who believes that fire is needed to fuel the organ that makes possible all the other products of culture, language included, the human brain. Every animal on earth is constrained by its energy budget. The calories obtained from food will stretch only so far. And for most human beings, most of the time, these calories are burned not at the gym, but invisibly, empowering the heart, the digestive system, and especially the brain. In the silent work of moving molecules around, within and among, its 100 billion cells. A human body at rest devotes roughly one-fifth of its energy to the brain, regardless of whether it is thinking anything useful or even thinking at all. Thus, the unprecedented increase in brain size that hominids embarked on around 1.8 million years ago had to be paid for with added calories either taken in or diverted from some other function in the body. Many anthropologists think the key breakthrough was adding meat to the diet. But Wrangham and his Harvard colleague, Rachel Carmody, think that's only part of what was going on in evolution at that time. What matters, they say, is not just how many calories you can put into your mouth, but what happens to the food once it gets there. How much useful energy does it provide after subtracting the calories spent in chewing, swallowing, and digesting? The real breakthrough, they argue, was cooking. Human beings evolved to eat cooked food. It is literally possible to starve to death even while filling one's own stomach with raw food. In the wild, people typically survive only a few months without cooking, even if they can obtain meat. Carmody explains that only a fraction of the calories in raw starch and protein are absorbed by the body directly via the small intestine. The remainder passes into the large intestine, or bowel, where it is broken down by that organ's ravenous population of microbes, which consume the lion's share for themselves. Cooked food, by contrast, is mostly digested by the time it enters the colon. For the same amount of calories ingested, the body gets roughly 30% more energy from cooked oat, wheat, or potato starch, as compared to raw, and as much as 78% from the protein in an egg. In Carmody's experiments, animals given cooked food gain more weight than animals fed the same amount of raw food, and once they've been fed on cooked food, mice, at least, seem to prefer it. I think we all know dogs also prefer it. Like, if you've ever had to feed your dog the rice and chicken blend, mm. yep. it, quote, in essence, cooking, including not only heat, but also mechanical processes, such as chopping and grinding, outsources some of the body's work of digestion, so that more energy is extracted from food and less expended in processing it. Cooking breaks down collagen, the connective tissue in meat, and softens the cell walls of plants to release their stores of fat and starch. The calories to fuel the bigger brains of successive species of hominids came at the expense of the energy-intensive tissue in the gut, which was shrinking at the same time. You can actually see how the barrel-shaped trunk of the apes morphed into the comparatively narrow-waisted Homo sapiens. Cooking freed up time as well. The great apes spend four to seven hours a day just chewing, not an activity that prioritizes the intellect. End quote. So, yeah. I mean, but you can think a lot while you're chewing. Mm, still, it's so much <laughs> chewing. It's why we have smaller jaws, it's so much too. <laughs> it's just too much. 
So basically, not only did cooking give us more energy, it would also give us more free time, right? Because we didn't need to sit around for eight hours or more a day munching on leaves and berries. You know what I often wonder? Like, who was (laughs) the first person to try out something new? And I don't only mean that when it comes to cooking or eating, but with all things. But yes, also with cooking. Who was the first to realize that you could make cheese out of milk? Who was the first to try this apple juice, you know, that was left out in the sun for too long and that makes you feel weird when you drink it? Who was the first to figure, hey, these shrooms give you a really bad trip, but if you drink the pee of the reindeer who ate the mushroom, it's much, much nicer. (laughs) Completely different topic, of course, but I think you get what I'm saying. And I think most of it was trial and error and also by accident, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, Every time my mom would eat oysters... Every time. It's just like, who first opened an oyster and thought, yes, yes. Wow, does that look good? Like, no. Mm -mm. Who? For example, yogurt. Or better, fermented milk. So that apparently happened in Central Asia or in Mesopotamia. Uh, 9,000 years ago, the first milk-giving animals were domesticated. First there were the sheep, then the goats, later the cows, the donkeys, and so on. Historians assume that people saw how the offspring drank the milk, you know, just like human babies, and that's what gave them the idea to milk them and try the milk. And of course, milk can spoil easily, especially in warm regions before ice boxes were invented, so people thought it could be a good idea to store the milk in animal stomachs, like a sheep stomach, a goat stomach. What they didn't know was that the stomach contains an enzyme that would ferment the milk giving it a sour yet kind of pleasant flavor and a thicker consistency. Speaking of preventing milk from spoiling, I think most of you know the fable of the two frogs in a milk jug, do you? I don't. So two frogs fall into a milk jug and of course they can't get out because of the the shape of the milk jug. The walls are like... Slippery and the wrong shape, yep. Mm. And they try to stay alive and they start swimming. But pretty soon, one of the frogs gives up and he stops swimming, and it just sinks to the bottom of the milk jug and he drowns. The other frog has hope and he doesn't give up. He keeps swimming the whole night through, moving his little frog legs. And wouldn't you know it, come morning, the frog has turned the milk into butter, and he can now easily climb out of the jug. I think it's a pretty good story and it goes with the slogan of our podcast, right? Keep going. Yes. Keep your little frog legs kicking. I've never heard that one. I love it. I like that one. It's not the only time that frogs have been connected with milk, though. In Russia and Finland, people used to believe that if you put a frog into your milk jug, the milk would stay fresh longer. Oh, can you imagine the look on the first frog's face when it was like, okay, kid, off you get, go find a frog. But why did they believe that? How did the frogs end up in the milk cans in the first place to even make such an assumption? Well, apparently, the farmers would often store the cans with fresh milk in a stream or a creek or whatever natural flowing water they had close by. And of course, frogs could sometimes end up in the cans. Yes. Sometimes there's just a frog in the can and there's there's nothing you can do about it. There's certain aspects of this episode that I just find are just so funny to me. And I, I think it's just me. So... This is a farmer explaining such an incident to the New York Times in a, I, I, it's, I think it's one of our favorite letters to the editor so far. Love it. (laughs) I was so happy when I found it. (laughs) It's so good, Johanna. I die. All right. This is from the New York Times, 6th of November, 1854, Monday, page two. Quote, how frogs sometimes get into milk cans. Whitlockville, Wednesday, November 1st, 1854. Dear Sir, I perceive in the times of today a paragraph stating the fact for public consideration that a live frog was found in a can of milk delivered on Randall's Island, that it was exhibited before your worthy, quote, ten governors at their session yesterday, etc., etc., I also noticed, going the rounds of the daily press, some weeks since, an announcement that a gentleman of your city, on opening a can of quote-unquote pure country milk, was astonished with the discovery of a frog peering curiously at him from its lactal quarters. Apparently contented with its strange home, 
but exciting strong doubts in the gentleman's mind whether the milk, as well as its tenant, might not be somewhat amphibious in its nature. Now, I understand that our city cousins, by a fallacious mode of reasoning, draw from these and similar facts the conclusion that we, honest farmers, mingle water with the milk we send them. I like that honest farmers is in quotation. They, yeah, that we honest farmers, quote unquote, <laughs> mingle water with the milk we send them. For, say they, quote, the only accidental way frogs could be introduced into the milk would be in the water that is poured into the cans. Our city vendors, if they administer water at all, must get it from the croton pipes, which of course do not afford the animal. Therefore, he must slip in away back at headquarters in the country, where the milk is slyly diluted in the gray evening or, m <laughs> <laughs> or morning or morning twilight as it is taken from the cows. Now, Mr. Editor, I do not claim ability to account for, quote, the milk in the coconut, but, with your permission, I will illustrate to our city friends how a frog may very naturally happen in their milk without necessarily affording even a circumstantial evidence that water is also there. Milk requires to be cooled by artificial means immediately after being taken from the cows, if we would preserve it properly for any length of time. I have a fine spring of the coldest water close beside my milking yard, into which the cans are placed as they are filled with the milk. To expedite the cooling process, the covers are removed, but, mind you, the water around the cans does not quite reach to the top. A spring of water and the rivulet purling from it very naturally have a few amphibious denizens, and it is well known that a frog, suddenly disturbed, makes a very reckless leap toward the water in most cases, utterly regardless of consequences. <laughs> I just need to repeat that bit for you. It is well known that a frog, suddenly disturbed, makes very reckless leaps toward the water, utterly regardless of consequences. I have myself, <laughs> on more than one occasion, seen a portly fellow, in making for the spring, plump headlong into a can of pure, unwatered milk, giving me <laughs> some trouble to capture and remove his frog ship. The first time I saw the accident, it rather shocked my notion of propriety, and I incontinently turned the contents of the can into the pig's trough, but afterward concluded inasmuch as we drink of the spring in company with the amphibia, it was more nice than wise to be so fastidious about our city cousins. So. We forward the milk in such cases as though nothing had happened. <laughs> what, what we're saying to you is, listen, sometimes there are frogs in the milk. Sometimes we catch them before they get to your door. Sometimes we don't. That's just how it is. It's fine. In the country. <laughs> it's fine. It's absolutely drinkable. You just scoop that frog out <laughs> and put him into the next can of milk. Everything is fine. Don't put frogs in milk, everyone. They drink through their skin. Okay. Such accidents are really rare with us, and we always aim to expel the intruders, but they might be overlooked, as doubtless happened in the grave case brought before the governors yesterday, thus bringing undeservedly a dark shadow of suspicion upon the innocent when, probably, <laughs> there are guilty ones in abundance between the producer and the consumer who merit your most suspicious scrutiny. Most respectfully yours, etc., etc., a Westchester farmer, end quote. Don't you have the feeling that if a person keeps repeating that he didn't do something, he did it? Yeah, maybe. Maybe <laughs> they do put water in frogs in. Maybe the frogs are all on purpose. Who can say? But the thing that's interesting is that in 2012, scientists actually studied frog secretions and found several peptides with antibacterial properties. So there could actually be a connection between milk not spoiling, and frogs. I love frogs. This mm. was all fascinating to me. As I said before, frogs drink through their skin, so I'm sure his frog ship was happy to be caught and put back in the stream. <laughs> and I really liked the fact that the guy used his frog ship <laughs> to describe the frog. <laughs> all right. So 
Some food innovations were made out of a necessity, as we said, to make your food last longer, to keep it from spoiling. Frogs. Others, I have the feeling, were made out of sheer, well, let's see what that will be like, and fuck it, we can do whatever we want. Because I would love to talk to you about the weirdest recipes throughout history. Are you ready? Maybe there's something for you for the next time you need to impress your (laughs) in-laws. You all heard of a turkey key, a turkey stuffed with another turkey, or a turducken. I know people that have done that. It's a turkey stuffed with a chicken, and the chicken is stuffed inside a duck. Like, why? (laughs) But okay. But have you heard of a roti sopare? The roast without equal. It's a recipe that was introduced in 1807 by Alexandre Balthasar Laurent Crimaud de la Reynière in his Almanach de Gourmand. (laughs) He was a lawyer in 19th century France who made a name for himself, not as a lawyer, but as a lover of fine dining, an old-time foodie, so to say. He was known for his lavish dinner parties where he would, for example, dress up a live pig as a politician, or he would host his own funeral to see who would actually attend this event. <laughs> he sounds fun. So he came up with this roti sans pareil, and it uh, consists of 17 birds stuffed into one another. 17 deboned birds. Ugh, that's too many birds. I don't even know from which side I should start to tell you. Do you want to go big to small? Biggest to smallest or small to big? <laughs> go big to small. Big to small. the biggest one, the, yeah, the first one, the bustard. How would you say that? Bustard? Bust, how do you say the first bird? Bustard or bustard? Bustard. We don't have them here. I had to look it up because I was like, is that supposed to be buzzard? Who eats <laughs> buzzards? And then I looked it up and found out about this giant flying bird that I didn't really know anything about, the bust bustard. So the first is a bustard, or bustard. Bustard, I don't know. Not, a, but but not bustard. a bastard, bustard. In it goes the turkey. In that one goes the goose. In the goose goes the pheasant. In the pheasant goes the chicken. In the chicken goes the duck, followed by a guinea fowl, followed by a teal, followed by a woodcock, followed by a partridge without a pear tree. <laughs> A plover. A plover. Piping plovers are like an endangered species here. A lapwing. I don't know which that one is. It has nope, to be really small either. already, though. Mm, yeah. A quail. Quail. A thrush. A lark. An oh. ortolone bunting. And a garden warbler. Not garden songbirds, for the love of God. Now, sometimes the space in between the birds would be filled with sausage, meat, or ham. Sometimes there would be no in-between layers, but the important part was that the garden warbler was small, but it was big enough to be stuffed with a single olive. Some (laughs) even say to stuff an anchovy with a caper and stuff the olive with that. The whole thing could have had more than 20 layers. But don't worry, the roast without equal is not the first time humans thought that stuffing several animals into one another was a great idea. By the way, the practice of stuffing one animal into one another is called angestration. That was a new word for me, by the way. Never heard it before. Yeah. The Romans liked to stuff pigs and cows with smaller animals. I think there was even something they called the Trojan bear. Oh. Mm -hmm. In the Gulf region, there was a similar recipe that, uh, that you would stuff several layers into a camel. Then there's the true love roast, that's 12 birds, and the whole thing then takes up to 10 hours to cook and can feed up to 130 people. And I read in an article that there are gourmet shops that will prepare the true love roast for you and you just have to put it in the oven. Probably a gigantic oven, but... (laughs) Yeah, if you have a commercial oven or a... Probably. (laughs) I don't understand why. Why do you one day wake up and think, you know what would be a great idea? Stuff this lovely turkey with a gazillion of other birds. <laughs> <laughs> Just birds. Put more birds. Put more birds in it. Can't have enough birds. Bird is birds. a word. <laughs> and we can't forget the Tudor or Yorkshire Christmas pie. Don't confuse it with the Yorkshire pie. I think the Tudor and the Yorkshire Christmas pie are not exactly the same. They are really similar. I think they, they might just be slightly different with the kind of meat and poultry you use, right? Yeah. 
examinerlife.co.uk says in an article titled The Lost Yorkshire Christmas Pie Once Enjoyed by the Rich and Powerful. Quote, It was ludicrously expensive and difficult to make, which meant only the rich and powerful got to enjoy one. Consumers of Yorkshire Christmas pies included the first US President George Washington and Queen Victoria. Okay, so what made this pie the ultimate seasonal fress? Is fress a word used in English? I've never heard the word fress used in conversation before. I think what they mean is the German word fressen, which means eating but in a very glutinous way. Oh, okay. In short, the volume and variety of birds that went into it, according to Kessel's Dictionary of Cooking from 1883, quote, Turkey, pheasants, ducks, fowls, grouse, snipes, and tongue. Any or all of this may enter into their, com into their composition, end quote. I always thought that a snipe was a fake bird. Isn't that the whole thing in ice when they go snipe hunting? Or am I thinking of something else? No idea. All right. <laughs> Sorry. The article continues. The birds were boned, partially stewed, and stuffed with wheel mints before the birds were stuffed inside each other Russian doll style. A hair could also be added, according to Hannah Glass's The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy from 1747, which contained the first written record of a Yorkshire Christmas pie. If the name Hannah Glassy, I, th I think it's Glassy, right? Hannah Glassy? I would probably say Glass. Or Hannah Glass, yeah. It's G-L-A-S-S-E. Yeah. If that name sounds familiar, it's because the first written record of a Yorkshire pudding appeared in the same cookbook. Glass's recipe for Yorkshire Christmas pie required nearly 2 two kilogram, that's 4.5 pounds of butter, and at least 4 hours in the oven. The pastry casing was ornate, reflecting the status of the lucky folks who would be eating it. The final article could easily stretch to 50 centimeters, which is 19 inches tall, and was at least as wide. She noted, quote, Pies are often sent to London in a box as presents. Therefore, the walls must be well built. Mm. All that butter for the crust. Mm -hmm. One was sent from Sheffield to the Lord Chancellor Henry Brougham in 1832, which, according to Castle, collapsed under its own weight. Castle also noted the Yorkshire Christmas pie, described by Charles Dickens as like a Ford, quote unquote, was already dying out by the late Victorian era. It might explain why you can't buy one anymore. High-end food retailers like Fortnum and Mason sell a large Christmas pie, minus the Yorkshire bit, with turkey, cranberries and stuffing, but it's not the same. Still, <laughs> if you have a shooting estate, a very skilled chef and a massive oven, you could have a go. End quote. You just need a few things. Very easy. Just so easy to attain. You just need a massive oven and a shooting estate get right on that. But that, that has me thinking so much of Tudor Week on the Great British Bake Off. And I'm just imagining all that butter being layered and layered and layered into flaky pastry now. Now I'm hungry. Okay. So speaking of the Tudors, uh, there is one last recipe I would like to present to you. The Cockan Trees. Apparently, in medieval times, you really wanted to impress your fancy guests, not only by a gazillion dishes being served, you also wanted to make them believe that you're serving them an actual impossible animal, one that shouldn't exist. A cockatrice. It's a piglet, well, it's a piglet's front, sewn onto the bottom of a turkey. Turkey or similar sized other bird. So they sew it together, and sometimes they would even cover it with gold foil. So it's not a modern fad to cover food with gold leaves. It's, it's all been done before. It's all yeah. just history repeating constantly. I don't know. I mean, <sighs> the, the stuffing animals with animals is already... I'm on the fence with that one. But I feel so bad about these animals being sewn together. Don't get me wrong, I eat meat, even though nowadays I try to avoid pork because I just love pigs so much. They're so cute. And I try my best to not buy factory farmed meat, which is for me mostly working out because I live in the countryside with lots of farmers around. I'm not judging the meat eating, but the preparation of the animal, sewing it on another animal, it feels so wrong, so disrespectful to me, the way this is handled. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I do. I do. I feel a similar way to you as well. I think it's easier for me if it's all, if it's all actually food, I'm sort of more okay with it, as long as people are eating it, which is the intent. But I hear you. I try to avoid factory farming, but 
it's a lot more expensive here and it's just not an option for everyone. Yeah. I would say it's a real privilege, isn't it? To be able to pick and choose what we eat and why and when, isn't it? Like yeah. just, it's, it's one of those silly little things to think about sometimes, isn't it? But just like, if you got to choose what you wanted to eat today. 100% like, privilege, yeah. That's pretty amazing, you know? That reminds me of a, a discussion I had with my, my husband. You know how people always say, oh, if my ancestors uh, from 500 years ago could see my iPhone or my, my computer or my car, they would be like freaking out and think I'm the king. And I was like, you know what would really make them freak out? Our spices that we have in the, in the kitchen cabinets. The spices, the spices and the in medicine the cabinets. we own. Can you yeah. imagine what they would say? I mean, they, have no, they would have no concept of a phone. Or computer, air conditioning. But the spices. Yeah. Just clean water on demand. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. If you live somewhere with clean water on demand, you are blessed. Like, seriously. Oh, that's still a problem for s most people on this planet, yeah? Absolutely. Clean water on tap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sometimes it just, it, it does help me to kind of reset my brain just a little bit and remember these things because it's wild, isn't it? Okay, so eating food, it's necessary to survive. Our body needs energy, but once that primary need is satisfied, there are other reasons why people eat certain things. Sometimes it's because the food promises some health benefit, or in some cases, perhaps it's considered an aphrodisiac. Of course, the word aphrodisiac comes from the Greek goddess of love herself, Aphrodite, an aphrodisiac is a substance that you can ingest that promises heightened sexual arousal. Some drugs are considered an aphrodisiac, some legal, some not, like cocaine or MDMA, which was used in couples therapy back mm -hmm. in the 70s. Some plants, like horny goat weed, we have to mention <laughs> that one because, I mean, horny goat weed. It's right there in the name. <laughs> it's just, you might have heard different love potions or Spanish fly. So let's talk about Spanish fly because that's an interesting one. I think it used to be one of the most infamous names for an aphrodisiac potion. Um, if you're a fan of the Beastie Boys, you if you're from relatively familiar with it. And you could and probably still can buy it in adult shops or order it from naughty magazines. But those included mostly just water, alcohol, and sugar, so a placebo. But there is a true Spanish fly, and it was not made from a fly, but from a beetle the so-called blister beetle. Those little buggers have their name for a reason. When they feel the need to defend themselves, they will produce a secretion called cantharidin. When your skin gets in contact with cantharidin, it actually blisters. But still, someone was like, hey, I bet if we ate that, <laughs> it would make us hornier. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That didn't happen. It was first used in ancient Rome and in Greek to treat skin diseases because they were like, ooh, that looks bad. Wonder what'll happen if we just make blisters on it. <laughs> and then <laughs> I swear that's how like half of my meds were developed. <laughs> it's uh. fine. <laughs> and then in China, they began to mix it with human excrement and arsenic to create the world's first stink bomb. Wow, humans are really something. <laughs> but just a hot minute later, humans figured out that cantharidin, you just told me what we think it is, and I've already forgotten. Cantharidin. 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 We later figured out that cantharidin could be used as a love potion. And the Roman Empress Livia, she was the wife of the first Roman Emperor Augustus, she, for example, used to invite family, friends, and fiends over to a feast, and then she would have, she'd, she'd dose everybody with Spanish fly without their knowledge, right? So she mixed it in with all the food and wine, and they didn't know. So it was not their fault when everything turned into an enormous orgy on account of all the aphrodisiac <laughs> they didn't know they consumed. See, doesn't that just reframe all of Caligula for you? Those poor people. Dosed dosed unsuspectingly. And that is why people did out such outrageous things at Livia's feasts. And then Livia would then use what she saw at her feasts to blackmail her guests. <laughs> nice. That's kind of a, a very elaborate plan. It seems it's very Machiavellian. 
<laughs> but the blister beetle wasn't the only thing that Romans used as an aphrodisiac. They also used gladiator sweat and blood. Maybe tears, who can say? But for real, gladiators were kind of sex symbols. I mean, obviously, we've all seen gladiator. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why that made me laugh. I don't mean to objectify the gladiators. But they were sort of sex symbols. They were athletic superstars, and their hypermasculine appearance made people think that their sweat and blood could get a man and woman in the mood. So after a fight, before the gladiator could clean up, his skin was scraped, and all of that sweat, dirt, and blood was collected, mixed with olive oil, and then sold to Roman citizens. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, Messi, The Rock, Serena Williams, Michael Jordan? They're just selling sweat as a love potion. <laughs> I don't. Ah, <sighs> all right. So, say you don't want gladiator sweat then. What else are your options? How about some ambergris to awaken your sexual desire? You might know ambergris as a very valuable ingredient in perfume, but what is it exactly? Well, it's basically produced in a sperm whale's digestive system. It's a secretion formed in the bile duct, and the whales use it to digest hard objects. For example, squid beaks. So, after it's digested, this waxy, dark mass is then pooped out by the whale, or bigger particles might be vomited out, and then the amber grease is found floating around or lying on beaches. The pieces are of all shapes and sizes, and usually weigh about half an ounce, which is 15 grams, to 50 kilograms, which is 110 pounds. So, you could find a tiny, tiny piece, or a giant rock of it, and sometimes even bigger. At first, the ambergris is a pale color, but over time, the mass will turn dark and harden due to photodegradation and oxidation in the ocean. And most notably, the smell completely changes. It becomes sweet and earthy. I mean, obviously, it doesn't keep on smelling like poop, because <laughs> otherwise, it wouldn't be a very expensive ingredient in perfume. Ah, uh, never say never. As we know by now, humans have pretty weird ideas. I'm sure somebody would have thought, well, that could make a nice perfume <laughs> for my enemies. <laughs> it's true. It's a fair point. Well, somebody had the idea to use amber grease not only in perfume, where it is very highly valued. So one gram, which is 0 0.03 ounces of amber grease, costs 20 to $27, making it more expensive than gold. But how do you use ambergris as an aphrodisiac? Well, first of all, like any other aromatic substance from a living being, it's a pheromone. Wikipedia says this, quote, A pheromone is a secreted or excreted chemical factor that triggers a social response in members of the same species. Pheromones are chemicals capable of acting like hormones outside the body of the secreting individual to affect the behavior of the receiving individuals. There are alarm pheromones, food trail pheromones, sex pheromones, and many others that affect behavior or physiology, end quote. It's basically a, a, a substance that communicates something yeah. with us when we smell it. That's why in German, a pheromone is considered a so-called Botenstoff, which translates to messenger substance. I'd say. Oh, I see. I love German. Fascinating. And of course, nowadays, we know how important sex pheromones are for desire. The smell of a person, mostly on a subconscious level, will influence if you find someone attractive. Not all pheromones are sexy. Like, it's the reason why babies feel better when they can smell their mothers. This kind of thing, right? But many, many perfumes have been and are still produced that promise to make you irresistible. So by that logic, using a perfume containing ambergris could, in theory, act as an aphrodisiac to the person smelling you. Elizabeth I, by the way, was wearing an ant was always wearing an amulet made from ambergris. Which I love the smell of amber grease. I don't do you like the smell? I hate it. Oh do you? I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think with smells, we're really the complete opposite. I thought we were the same, because otherwise it's like lavender. It's probably one of my favorites. Lavender is like the only flowery scent. Like, I like flowery scent in the garden, like roses yeah. and everything, but I don't like it anywhere else. And I love uh, sweet and fruity. Mm, yeah. Like berries, uh, all, all different kinds of fruits, vanilla. Oh, I can't but do vanilla. Not too heavy. Yeah. Like yeah. No. All right. 
Well, speaking of vanilla and berries, ambergris was ingested by many people, which I wouldn't have thought of it being particularly edible. Uh, not that it's ever stopped anybody before. Uh, and they <laughs> hoped it would bring them, they hoped it would bring them fertility and potency. So Marie Antoinette would flavor her hot chocolate with almond, orange, and ambergris. Casanova would put ambergris in his mousse au chocolat. I've probably pronounced that terribly. Making it twice as potent as chocolate is also considered an aphrodisiac. And King Charles I of England wanted ambergris grated on his eggs. His breakfast eggs. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously. And eating ambergris is not a thing of the past. You can still enjoy ambergris-flavored tea in Morocco. Of course, we need to mention that, unfortunately, many, many animals have been and are still hunted, killed, and tortured for alleged aphrodisiac properties that do not exist. They're not real. We're debunking it all. It's all bullshit. Poachers go after rhino horn and tiger penis. But ambergris is the only scent used by humans that is produced by an animal that doesn't include any hunting, killing, or torturing. Fresh ambergris doesn't have any value. It has to ripen for months. It has to sit and just for ages in the ocean, changing into this thing that Mm. it will eventually become. So if you're hunting the sperm whales, they're not going to be puking out the ambergris anymore. It does happen, though, but... So that's why, if you're not sure, only use stuff that's that's labeled F-L-O-T-T-E, ambergris. That means it was found floating, certified mm-hmm. floating. And that's good. So you can see why it's so valuable. Now, if ambergris is not to your liking or it's too expensive and you want to try a different aphrodisiac, there is so much food, so many plants you can use. Asparagus, oysters, durian, chocolate, ginseng. Just look for anything that's vaguely like phallic or vulva-shaped foods, <laughs> and you can't go wrong. And don't worry, if you ingested too much of any aphrodisiac and you just can't get any satisfaction, you can simply fix yourself by eating a bowl of Kellogg's cornflakes. Because the staple breakfast cereal that was invented by John Harvey Kellogg. I don't know if we mentioned it before. If you read the book or saw the movie Road to Wellville, you will know immediately who we're talking about. He was an American physician who managed the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan, and he was a firm believer in a healthy body through abstinence. No alcohol, no nicotine, no drugs, no meat, and no touching yourself. The cornflakes he invented in 1894 were claimed as the super healthy breakfast, nutritious and wholesome. Wholesome? Yes, because Kellogg also praised his flakes for being so bland that it would help you to lower your sexual desire and stop masturbation. (laughs) I honestly would love to do a whole episode on John Harvey Kellogg and his Battle Creek Sanitarium, because there's so much to talk about, but I have no idea if that would be even interesting to the Hellions. I think it would be. I have a feeling. All right, we wouldn't be fresh hell if we wouldn't close this episode with at least some dead people. We would like to finish by telling you about some pretty weird and surprising death related to food. And no, not food poisoning, because that's neither weird nor surprising. No, it sucks, but it happens all the time. All right, so I think the most famous example of a food-related death is the 12th president of the United States, Zachary Taylor, who was elected in 1848. On the 4th of July, 1850, Taylor was attending a fundraiser at the Washington Monument, and he apparently ate a lot of cherries during that event. I don't know how many he ate, but it must have been rather a copious amount. Everybody said so later. Like, everyone was like, wow, he ate a lot of cherries (laughs) that night. So you know that it had to have been something, right? Or people would have had something else to talk about. And he did wash these cherries down with ice-cold milk. With frogs? Who can say how many frogs were ingested? It's a state secret. After he returned to the White House, he had a few glasses of water before he went to bed. Only a few hours later, he began to feel unwell. He complained about stomach cramps and digestive problems. He would not recover, and he died only five days later on July 9, 1850, at the age of 65. At first, his physicians thought, well, I mean, that's cholera, right? What else? I mean cholera. And he had contracted the bacterial infection probably from the milk. 
but some scientists believe that he may actually have died from gastroenteritis brought on by the acid in the cherries he consumed. Of course, we also need to add that Washington was not known for the best sanitary surroundings at that time. The capital had an open sewage system. So again, cholera. Could have been a lot of things, so. It could have been appendicitis. I keep wondering, Mm. like, did he just have an appendix rupture? Because it's right around that time that there was, like, the first... Anyway, who can say? But right after his death, rumors started to spread that Zachary Taylor had been assassinated. (gasps) And who had done it? Well, it was either the Catholics, the (laughs) Jesuit priests, or, you know, the pro-slavery people. In 1991, Zachary Taylor's body was actually exhumed and checked for arsenic, but they concluded that the arsenic levels were too low and he had not been poisoned. In the early 2000s, it was concluded that the arsenic testing in the 1990s was actually flawed and maybe it was arsenic. So basically today, we don't know if Zachary Taylor died from arsenic, cherries, milk, or a combination. This reminds me that the cherries and having stomach cramps afterwards. This reminds me, have you been told that too as a kid? Don't eat too many cherries and then drink water because you're going to get stomach cramps. No. Really? My grandma mm. always told me. My grandmother had this huge, huge, well, she had a lot of, of fruit trees, but a huge cherry tree as well. And I love to just, you know, when the cherries were ripe, the ones I could reach, I had a lot of cherries. Yeah, and she always told me, don't eat too many cherries and then drink water. It's bad for your stomach. Well, I was I was only just going to admit that we didn't really eat cherries very often as a kid. Cherries here, like we didn't have a cherry tree or anything. And I, I feel like cherries are pretty expensive. So we didn't really have cherries. The, I was going to say the, the cherries I most often had were fished out of the bottom of my parents' Manhattans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like 14 before I realized maraschino cherries didn't taste like whiskey. <laughs> Children of the eighties, but yeah, I, I think it's probably just because we didn't we didn't really get cherries. We were more like apples and plums and mm. that kind of stuff. But I wonder, I wonder if that's common knowledge among older people. Yeah, that's interesting. Anyway, dying because you consume a too big amount of something is really not unheard of. For example, in 2007, a woman died after consuming 7.5 liters of water. I'm sorry I didn't convert this to gallons. No, that's okay. We do liters, too. Ah, okay. Yeah, like a two-liter bottle of soda is the common. Okay. And she drank that in a very short amount of time for a radio contest where you could win a Nintendo Wii. The contest was held by the Sacramento radio station KDND-FM, and it was called, quote, Hold your wee for a wee. Oh, end quote. Awful. And after the woman's death, her husband sued the owner of the radio station for wrongful death, and he was actually awarded $16.5 million. Good. Yeah. You have to be so careful about water toxicity. It's a real danger, and it's one that I'm not sure everybody knows about. Like, you can drink too much water. It will kill mm. you. Just everything I mean, basically in everything, people. right? Yeah. It's like Paracelsus yeah. said. Yeah. Yeah. In 1974, a British health food enthusiast consumed mostly carrot juice. In just 10 days, he reportedly took in 70 million units of vitamin A and was subsequently poisoned. His skin had had literally turned yellowish-orange, which should have been a sign to maybe stop. Yeah, right? His doctor told him to stop it, and he didn't, and then died of uh, liver cirrhosis. Yeah. And speaking of too much, the Swedish king Adolf Fredrik, who was on the throne from 1751 to 1771, he died on 12th of February 1771 after indulging a really large meal, including lobster, caviar, sauerkraut, kippers, champagne, as well as 14 helpings of his favorite dessert, which is kind of a pastry, and hot milk. (sighs) Apparently his stomach simply burst when he went to bed. But I have to add, some do believe that this was nothing but contemporary propaganda to badmouth the late king and that he had actually died very unspectacular of heart failure or poisoning. Chun chun chun. I mean, that's always kind of a possibility. <laughs> it's always maybe poisoning, isn't it? Like, where were they poisoned? 
I think it's already come up, maybe, that I can't remember. I can never remember what I've said in my head, what I've said to you not on the podcast, <laughs> and what we've actually said on the podcast, so sorry. But did we already talk about how lobsters used to be only for poor people, like proper, yeah. real lobsters, and they would wash yeah. up on beaches here in piles, piles of, like, sea scorpions just everywhere. Servants would say, like, no more than three days a week or we're out. It's crazy. I read that they were even so there was so much lobster washed up that they were uh, ground up and used as fertilizer. They were, yeah, mm. yep, yeah. There are times because we were lucky enough to live on Cape Cod, where sometimes you could buy a lobster from less than for less than the cost of a Big Mac and fries. Right? It would be like three ninety nine a pound for a lobster, and my mom loved it. She really, really loved it. Like if you're a lobster eater, my mom ate the red stuff and the green stuff. She ate all the stuff. So whenever lobster was really affordable, my dad would go down to the grocery store and get her lobsters. And she'd have like half of it hot. And then he'd make her a lobster salad sandwich the next day mm. and like go every other day and get her lobsters and make her lobsters. So those are nice memories. We have a lot of really, really funny stories about my mom and lobsters. She was sort of a legend when it came to lobsters. So when, when you and Philip visit, we'll make you lobster and steamers and stuffed quahogs and corn on the cob. Can't wait. We'll go to the beach. If you like heat, come for the 4th of July. Now all the New England Hellions are longing for summer. They're ready. Are you an adventurous eater? I feel like you are, like my mom was. 100%. There is nothing I can think of that I wouldn't... Yeah, well, I can think of one thing, uh, two things that I would never try. Mm -hmm. One of it is the unmentional thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And the other one is a Scorpio. That that was something I I couldn't. I'm a person who eats all the street food everywhere. Yep. I try everything. I Ugh. eat all the the, the liver, stomach, uh, everything. I was yes. raised firmly believing that if an animal dies, for you to eat everything from that animal as much as possible should be consumed. Absolutely. Uh, I never liked the, this kind of just eat the filet, like everything, and be right. grateful and respectful of the animal. So yeah, I'm very adventurous. My father, he was a cook. And he taught me that I have to try everything at least once. It's fine if you don't like it, you don't have to eat it. Mm -hmm. But you can't say, I don't like it if you never tried it. So Absolutely. Yeah, that's how I live have, by. And also, you have to try it. If it's something you don't like, try it again every couple of years because your tastes do change. Yeah. They really do change. But I was, I have a res wicked restrictive diet now just because of my issues. But I used to be a really picky eater and I hated it. I hated it so much. People would be surprised when I would say, oh, I wish I wasn't a picky eater. Like, like it's something that you choose, you know what I mean? To be mm -hmm. like, quote, unquote, picky. But for me, it's not that I just don't fancy trying something. It's like certain consistencies or the smell of something immediately mm -hmm. makes me feel like I will be sick. And I would, if I tried to force myself to eat something like that, I would get sick. And it's humiliating and it's stressful and it sucks. I wish I was like, my parents and my sister and 99% of my family who all of them were eat anything, try, try something new. If it's on the menu, yep. just try it, just try it. And there must be something because we were all raised the same way and I'm not like, them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. I wish I could be. I really, if I could change five things about myself that being able to try anything and eat anything would 100% be on that top five. I hate being a picky eater. It's, yeah. And now I have such dietary restrictions. It's just a mess. If people invite us over for dinner, it's like my stress level goes through the roof because I was raised that you eat everything that's put on your plate. And even mm. if you don't particularly like it, you're polite and you eat it and whatever, but I physically can't do that anymore. So you always feel like you're, I don't know, a burden or like a... No, I, I know, know now that uh, when you come over, I can always give you rice and chicken. You can always give me white meat, chicken, rice, cheese cooked apples. Yep. You can always give me a toasted cheese sandwich. Perfect. We always have that at home. Always. Yep. I just wanted to shout out to the picky eaters out there because I'm sure there are people out there who are just picky and a pain in the ass and I'm not talking about those people. I always thought of picky eaters like that, like it's a choice. I never actually thought about them as really not being able to, to try it. So I learned something new today. Oh, it's awful. Like it'll make me start gagging and dry heaving. Mm. It's a nightmare. Yeah, I hate it. I really, 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 really wish I did not have that. 
so much. If I could change it, I would change it in a heartbeat. So I'm talking about those those folks. Yeah. No fun. You know what was fun this episode? <laughs> I hope everybody out there enjoyed it as much as we did. I do too. There's so much food history out there. So many things we could have talked about. This could be a whole podcast. Yeah. Yeah. It really could be. Really could be. Do you have something good for this week? I think my something good is is actually my, my father and my grandfather who taught me, well, not only my father, my grandfather, my, my grandmother, she was an excellent cook, excellent, really. My grandfather who made sausages and everything, like, once a year he would buy a whole pig and the whole pig would be, like, turned into sausages and ham and stuff. And I always mm. helped from since I was three years old. I learned a lot of things there, how how to appreciate food. And my father was the one who, who taught me to try everything and, and be a little bit adventurous when it comes to eating. Funnily enough, when he got older, he wasn't very adventurous eater anymore. He was already set in his way. He knew what he liked. Yeah, I think that's my something good this week. All the, yeah. the memories also that we have that concern eating, eating yeah. with the family. I do get that nowadays sometimes. Do you have that, that all of a sudden you have like a taste? I mean, we talked about it before and it's uh, signs from, from our loved ones. The taste of food you ate as a kid. Yes. Yes. It's funny that this is coming up because literally last night as I was laying in bed and starting to fall asleep, I had the most vivid memory of being at my grandpa's house on Melha Ave in Springfield and... It was this kitchen. They moved there in 19, probably 1945 is when they bought that house, if you can sort of picture that sort of style. And it had this red, this blue with red trim kitchen, little kitchen, through swinging door from the dining room. And it had a little tiny breakfast nook with a tight, with like benches and a tiny, 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 like 10 inch maybe television, black and white. And I had the strongest memory, like I could smell the kitchen, mm. just the most visceral memory of sitting in that little breakfast nook in the kitchen at grandpa's house, at my aunt's house, because she lived there too, and like coloring with my sister and watching like Sesame Street on the little teeny tiny TV and just how, what like a nice memory that was. Yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. A lot of happy kitchen memories there too. My parents were also like the, like your father. Not so much um we were never really in a situation to have like an entire animal from anywhere. My father-in-law lives in the country and, and gets that kind of stuff in the UK, but my parents were very very adventurous cooks and eaters and same always encouraged us to try everything and I you know it was a nightmare kind of at the time, but I have a lot of funny memories I laugh at now of like the first time we went to my aunt's and they gave us a Cornish game hen, these like tiny little birds. <laughs> they were like, so young. <laughs> like our parents didn't didn't fish finger us. You know what I mean? Like we were yeah. given adult food and expected to eat it. And yeah, it had a lot of happy memories. A lot of nightmares of sitting up all night at the table, but a lot of happy memories too. <laughs> I remember when uh, during the 80s, I don't know, Austria has a, a border with Italy and a lot of people since the 60s, when people started after the war to go on vacation again, many would go to Italy. When I was like five years old, my parents went to Italy with me for a week and it was great. And I, that started my lifelong passion for pasta and uh, spaghetti. And we came back and every day in Italy I ate spaghetti every day, every day, every day. And we came back and my grandfather used to pick me up from kindergarten and he used to cook for me every day. And then I would be like, I just eat <laughs> spaghetti from now on. And <laughs> he was, he was, I mean, he was born 1925, 26. Mm -hmm. he, he was a great cook, but not, Italian food was considered fancy in the 80s in Austria. But he, he started to make spaghetti for me in a way that he thought that it worked, which was absolutely not Italian, but I mean, it was so nice, right? That he really tried to feed me what I like. Yes. Just the fact that he tried. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really nice. Really nice memories. And the funny thing is sometimes I still make them like he used to make them. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. All right. So I think that's enough from our something good memories. Yeah. All right. Leave us a review if you can. It really helps us out. Uh, visit our homepage. You find all the links there. Freshhellpodcast.com. Send us an email, freshhellpodcast at gmail.com. Join our Facebook page. 
Be kind to your animal, be kind to your fellow human beings, and be kind to yourself. That's right. And if you yourself are going through hell, just keep churning that milk until it turns into butter. Keep moving those little frog legs. <laughs> keep your little frog legs kicking. <laughs> <laughs> Tschüss. Bye. <laughs>